ruddy field of battle one dark night in stealthy tread i was prowling round for plunder mid the dying and the dead i roughly seized a locket pressed upon a soldier's breast when words of pleading faintly uttered sought my purpose to arrest oh touch not my sister's locket let it lie upon my heart with a parting kiss i promised i would never from it part lonely orphans in our childhood with no one to love besides she hath been my more than mother friend and counselor and guide. Tis my dearest earthly treasure, but to thee of little worth would you rob a fellow soldier dying on this cold, cold earth. Oh, touch not my sister's locket, let it lie upon my heart, for with a parting kiss I promise I would never from it part. By the memory of thine own mother, let me plead with thee again. Though enemies we are sworn to be, let me die as if they friend. And with these words he sank to rest. In a new-made grave I left him with that locket on his breast. My sight is hazy, but in memory clearly see. Once I knew that soldier's story, enemies we could not be. Now I'm old, my sight is hazy, but in memory clearly see. Once I knew mine enemy's story, enemies we could not be. My father is a man of very few words when it comes to family matters. For example, when I was a teenager and going through a mildly wild stage, staying out all night, sleeping all day, that sort of thing, my mother, a university professor, and thus a woman of many words, approached the problem academically <laughs> with repeated and prolonged lecturing. This had absolutely no effect whatsoever. But one morning I woke up after being out all night and trying to get to bed, and I heard my mother taking this approach with my father in the next room. Dave, do something. Speak to your daughter. She's staying out all night, sleeping all day. It's shameful. A few minutes later, there was a light tap at my bedroom door. And the door opened up, and my father kind of peeked his head in, straightening his tie. He was getting ready to go to work. And he sort of spoke into the air of the bedroom. And he said, some people have found it useful to be asleep at night and awake during the day. <laughs> That's all I ever heard from him. Point taken. A man of very few words. When it came to family matters, but he loved to tell stories. Then he became a man of many words. And when I was little, he loved to tell stories, and I liked to listen to him, so I got to hear a lot of good stories. And he always had just the right story. So when I was that teenager going through my mildly wild stage was when he first told me about Minnie and Nellie. Minnie and Nellie, two notorious sisters out of our town's history, notorious in the 1870s for having gotten kicked out of the Women's Christian Temperance Union for their shocking, appalling behavior, bringing shame to their mother. He thought maybe I could relate to that story. <laughs> Actually, later on, he told me that Minnie and Nellie got themselves kicked out of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. It was of their own design. Because in the 1870s in central Missouri, the Women's Christian Temperance Union was the social scene for women. Well, it might have been the social scene for women, but it was very dull and boring to two high-spirited teenaged girls. So Minnie and Nellie decided to make sure they'd never have to go to another WCTU meeting. They'd concoct a little story, and they would repeat it, or they would tell it at the meeting. 
So they concocted this story with, oh, had to do about finding some grapes and stomping those grapes with their feet and fermenting some wine. And then there were a lot of, lot of scenes of debauchery and drunkenness. And they got kicked out, bringing shame to their mother. But they were happy. I loved Minnie and Nellie. <laughs> Minnie and Nellie, Minnie and Nellie. I asked for the story so many times. Minnie and Nellie just became one word. But after I heard it several times, I. I realized I'd heard about one of those sisters before because when I was a really little girl, my dad had told me a story about a little girl because I was a little girl and it was about a little girl. It was my favorite story at the time. And her name was Minnie. And Minnie had been four years old when on October 31st, 1862, her father had tossed her up into the air, given her a great big hug, set her down on the road, walked down the lane, gotten onto his horse, and ridden off to fight in the Civil War. Now, as my dad said when he told me the story, you know, Bethy Beth, when you're only four years old, what you remember is kind of close to the ground. And what little Minnie remembered of her father leaving were the spurs that he wore, because they were so shiny and they jangled as he walked down the lane. The spurs had been a gift to her father just that morning. For her father, Wesley Winans, was a reluctant soldier. Being 38 years old and with seven children to support, he was not supposed to have been conscripted into the Confederate Army from his Louisiana home. But as my dad always said, you know, war is not fair. And even though he didn't care for the Yankees, he was not enthusiastic about the Southern cause. He did not want to fight. And so just that morning, a good friend of his, a Captain Flournoy, had arrived with the gift of the Silver Spurs, an extravagant gift. And Minnie had watched her father put them on, the horseshoe-shaped silver fitting onto the back of his boot, and then a leather strap going all the way around the front to keep the silver on. And then her favorite part, the rowel, the spiked, shiny wheel that went round and round in the back. And Captain Flournoy had showed Minnie how he had had the spurs engraved. On one spur, he showed Minnie, was engraved her father's name, Winans, W-I-N-A-N-S, for they were his spurs. But on the other spur, he said, he engraved his own name, Flournoy, F-L-O-U-R-N-O-Y, so that Winans would know, so that her father would know, that he was never alone in battle, but that his friend was always with him. And Winans, as he put them on, had told Minnie, I'll be back with these silver spurs, Minnie, before you know it, given her that hug, put her down, walked down the lane, gotten onto his horse, and ridden off to war. My dad said, Beth, you know, when you're only four years old, it's difficult to understand war. It was difficult for Minnie to understand where her father was going or why, when she would go and wait for him in the lane to bring back those silver spurs. He did not come back. All she knew was that her father was gone. Only years later, when she was much, much older, and she read the diary that her father kept during the war, did she have a chance to understand the hardship that he faced, how desperately he longed for his family, and most of all, how desperately he longed to get home to them? May 30th, 1862. Two days protracted fierce fighting, evacuated Corinth, great waste and destruction, left at 3 o'clock and marched very hard nine hours until after midnight, so exhausted and defeated, fell to my sleep on a pile of wet tents. June 13th, 1862. We have now slept in the trenches for more than a fortnight. Fierce fighting all around us. Ticklish business, this. Southern and Yankee bullets perforate our trenches. June 18th, 1862. March two days without stopping. I am very unwell. Men are near mutiny. Yesterday and today, deserters shot very near me, but I would not see the execution. Today, I again applied for a flag of truce to recover the body of Sergeant John Vickers, who saved my life and who then fell to his death beside me, shot through the head. No word yet, and now it is night. Too late to recover Sergeant Vickers' body. Officials know nothing of the human soul. The more I have to do with officials, the more I am convinced that insolence and ignorance are helping to Jeff Davis us to the devil. June 26, 1862. No mail again today. Mississippi River blockaded by the damned Yankee gunboats. 
and so read yet again a letter from my wife dated one and a half months ago. Ah, that word which sums up all bliss, my wife. Oh, my wife, my children, how grateful to my hungry heart is a letter from home, like balm to a wound, ice to thirst, consolation to a wounded spirit, wine to one ready to faint. July 3rd, 1862. Request for four-week leave of absence again denied. Have been away from home nearly a year. Received notification today I am to be promoted to lieutenant colonel, a position I did not seek and do not want. I am informed that this promotion requires re-enlistment for the duration of the war. July 5th, I sent word declining this promotion and stating that re-enlistment is illegal given that I am over age under the conscript law and should not be here now. But no word came for Colonel Winans. July 30th, though, after much thought, he said, I have sent word that under protest, I would accept promotion and forced re-enlistment if and only if allowed four week leave of absence to see my family. July 31st, promotion final, leave of absence denied. Received letter from poor dear wife today, grieving over my forced re-enlistment, never knew her so moved. August 19th, 1862, splendid day, leave of absence granted by brigade and division authority. August 30, word from General Hardy, leave refused, leave denied. Today is little Minnie's fifth birthday. God bless her. November 25th, 1863, Colonel Wesley Parker Winans killed, Battle of Missionary Ridge, Tennessee, buried in a mass grave. And you know, when there is no body, no coffin, no funeral, no folded flag, it's difficult for a four-year-old girl to understand where her father is. All Minnie knew is that her father did not come home with those shiny silver spurs. Well, as my dad would always say when he would tell us these stories, one thing you can count on in life, time passes. And time passed for Minnie and her family. After the war, they moved from Louisiana up to central Missouri, and they started their life over. And little Minnie grew up to be one of those notorious sisters of Minnie and Nellie Faye. A few years later, she attended college and then graduated from the first college west of the Mississippi that accepted women. And a few years after that, moved to St. Louis, got married, and had children. Little Minnie became a mother. And she named her only son, Winans, after her father, taking her father's last name and giving it to her son for his first name, Winans, an unusual first name. And she raised her son with the only memory, the only true memory she had of her father. Well, Winans grew up. He became an engineer. He married and he had children. And little Minnie became a grandmother. And in the 1920s, Winans received, received a call from one of his colleagues. Winans, his colleague said, do you have relations in Iowa? No, said Winans, a strange question out of the blue. Why do you ask? Well, it seemed that his colleague had been on a road trip in Iowa. You know, a road trip in the 1920s was very different than it is today. You had to have a lot of tire patching material with you. And there wasn't the same fast food restaurant at every exit. Didn't even have those big exits. You had small roads. And if you were lucky, the road would go through a small town. And if you were lucky, the town would have a restaurant. And it seems that his colleague had gone to such a small town and such a small restaurant. And while they, waiting to pay the check after eating, his eye had been drawn to a dusty glass case in the corner. Strolling over to the corner, he peered inside, and, and there he told Winans that there was a bunch of old stuff. But way down on the next to the bottom shelf,